Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, this is our program on being tick safe in Vermont and understanding about ticks. My name is Lisa Sawsville and I'm with Vermont Coverts Woodlands for Wildlife. We're a statewide nonprofit that works to educate landowners and others about sound forest management and wildlife stewardship. You're welcome to visit our website, www.vtcoverts.org to learn more about the organization, make a donation or see other programs and events that are available. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Patty Casey. Uh, Patty is the Director of the Environmental Surveillance Program at the Vermont Agency of Agriculture since 2017. Before that, she was the state's Vector Surveillance Coordinator uh, for about five years. And she likes to know, uh, as many Vermonters, she's had a lot of different careers in her lifetime. She uh, studied wildlife biology at UVM. She received a writing degree from the Vermont College of Fine Arts worked in private industry in the nonprofit world, uh, and then finally is now settled into state government. She spent several years touring nationally as a musician and maintains an active music career. There's a lot of that going on in Montpelier that I know about. <laughs> um, Patty started in vector surveillance as a field and lab tech and quickly assumed the role of vector surveillance coordinator. She expanded that program significantly before division restructuring put her in charge of not only vector surveillance, but also the statewide groundwater pesticide monitoring program and Vermont's pollinator health program. Uh, Patty has spearheaded several innovative tick surveillance efforts and is overseeing a statewide tire slicing program to reduce mosquito breeding habitat on farms. Uh, Patty likes to note that she grew up in Virgins, which is where I am, so really excited to hear about that, uh, which is also known as the smallest city in Vermont and has the best Memorial Day parade ever. And uh, she now lives in Montpelier, which is also known as the smallest capital in the United States. So it's, it's like you like things small, Patty, like ticks uh, as well. So uh, Patty's going to share with us more, more about ticks. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now, Patty. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen here with you. Um, so um, Lisa and I were just struggling with technology. I need a millennial in my house, but um, let's see here. I don't have one right now. Oh, let's see here. Okay, does that look like a something it should look like? Yes, it does, Patty, all is set. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, so the my my little handicap today is that we we did manage to get this up on the screen so that you can see it, but I um, I'm not able to see my notes. So um, forgive me, I may overlook a couple of things or forget uh, that I have an upcoming slide that I'm going to be talking about. So uh, bear with me. But yes, um, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I am the Environmental Surveillance Program Director, as Lisa said, and I am a busy woman over here. There's a lot of um, a lot of cool stuff that we do. And um, I'm fortunate in that um, I kind of fly under the radar a little bit. And um, so I can make up stuff as I go along. And um, I've worked with um, Lisa's husband a little bit on some uh, tick surveillance stuff down in the southern part of the state. So I, I come up with ideas to look for um, different ticks in the state. And I Nobody has told me to stop doing what I'm doing, so I just kind of forge ahead and do what I want to do. So, okay, let's see if this works here. Okay, so um, sometimes there's a little lag, but let me know if the slides are not uh, advancing. So are you looking at a overview slide? Yes, we are. Okay, good. All is well with the world. Okay, so what I hope to give you today is a little bit of um, a life cycle and life history about ticks in Vermont, um, some of their behaviors, um, a little bit on tick bite prevention, tick management and control in the environment, and a little bit of what the Vermont Agency of Agriculture is up to in terms of tick surveillance. And I do hope that I don't ruin your lunch because we are gonna be talking about ticks, so. Okay, so what is a tick? Um, ticks are not insects, they are arthropods. They are closely related to mites, spiders, scorpions, and daddy long legs. And you can tell they have eight legs and a fused body that is their 
that big oval thing is their head and their abdomen all fused together. And the thing that's sticking off the top, it looks like a head, is actually their capitulum. It's where their swords and knives and saws live. Um, there are about 80 species of ticks in the U.S., 850 species worldwide, and we are blessed with 15 species of ticks recorded in Vermont so far. Um, six species are known to bite humans and can transmit diseases. And uh, more than 99% of all the tick-borne diseases reported to the Vermont Department of Health are caused by one tick, the black-legged tick, which is also known as the deer tick in Vermont. I tend to call it the black-legged tick. And when I'm around my geeky sciencey friends, we call them eye scaps because it's Ixodes scapularis is the um, Latin name, and we just shorten it to eye scap. We also have dog ticks, which I'll go into a little bit more. And we have um, a lot of host specific ticks in Vermont. So rabbit ticks, beaver ticks, uh, woodchuck ticks, the awful, horrible moose tick, um, and a lone star tick, which we don't see very often. And we also have our eyes open for some, uh, some invasive tick species. And that was what I was doing down in the Southern part of the state, looking at deer. Um, near the Massachusetts and New York border during the deer harvest, um, looking for something called the longhorn tick, which we do not yet have reported in Vermont, but which is a, a tick of uh, livestock and wildlife concern. So here is a comparison between um, uh, the American dog tick, which is also called the wood tick, although they're not found much in the woods, ironically. Um, and a black-legged tick. So you can see, these are the two ticks that 99.9% .9 of the time, this is what you're gonna run into if you're out in the woods. So the one on the left, the American dog tick is, is quite a bit bigger and faster. And even though they can't really make you sick in Vermont, they creep me out more than the deer ticks just because they're big and fast. They're the ones that have some white along their backs. So the one on the left is a female the one on the right is a male. They both have some white markings. Um, and the, the whites, is, the, I'm sorry, the, the females, the white area is confined to her scutum, which is that smaller oval space within the larger body. Um, and then the male has the white all down the back. And then over on the right is um, the deer tick or black legged tick. And the female has a reddish brown body with a, that the scutum is usually pretty black. That looks a little brown, but um, it's it's usually kind of black. They're about sesame seed sized as adults, the, the um, deer ticks. And the the nymphs, which is up top there, they're just about a poppy seed size. So they're very, very hard to see on your skin. Okay, so this would have been a lot easier to do with my notes because this is kind of complicated, but um, so the, the black-legged tick life cycle is about two years. Believe it or not, it can stretch to three, um, but typically it's a two-year or a little bit over two-year life cycle. So if you are, think of yourself as a tick egg, speaking of ruining your lunch, um, you would be hiding in the leaf litter in the spring. Um, you might have spent the winter there and you will hatch into a larva in the spring. And then it, uh, when you're a larva in the late spring, early summer, you're gonna start looking around for your first meal. And that's gonna be probably a mouse, possibly a chipmunk, you know, a small rodent, maybe a bird um, that might be on the ground. And then um, you are gonna feed and you're gonna drop off. And you could, you might feed, but you might not be lucky enough to find a meal. Um, in which case you would uh, overwinter again in the uh, leaf litter as a larva. But most, you know, if you're successful, you're going to get a blood meal. And then in the spring, you are going to molt again. You're going to turn into a nymph. So you're now in the, you're a year out and you are a nymph. And at this point you have eight legs where the larvae only have six. So you're starting to look more like a spider instead of a bug. So you um, will go and find uh, a meal. And um, that could also be a bird or a mouse uh, or a, a meso mammal, a medium sized mammal. Um, and they nymphs do get on large uh, mammals as well, including us. So you're gonna develop for a while. 
Um, and then you're going to drop off and become an adult probably later in the summer. And you, when you drop off and you're going to turn into an adult and, um, then you will feed on a large mammal, um, and drop off and lay your eggs and you could drop off and lay your eggs in the fall or in the spring. So that's why there's a little bit of variability in the length of their, um, lifespan. Um, and again, my notes not being in front of me, I can't remember if I say this later, but, um, we see, um, a lot of. Um, nymphal activity in the summer months, June, July. And that is typically when um, that's the, the highest um, risk for contracting a disease is in the summer months, because that's when the nymphs are active. It is not that the nymphs have more viral load. Um, it is simply that they are much, much harder to detect on your skin. So um, they actually have a lower pathogen prevalence, nymphs have a lower path pathogen prevalence overall because they've only had one meal um, and they're looking for their second one. So um, when an egg hatches out to a larva, the larva are what's known as clean, meaning that they do not carry the diseases that we have around here. So they need to pick up a disease from a host and then um, they're capable of transmitting it. So the more opportunities that they have for a meal, the more likely they are to pick up a disease in the environment. So um, that's why even though nymphs have a lower pathogen prevalence, we're more likely to get sick from their bites just because they get on us and we don't know that they're there and they can become engorged without us being aware that they're there. So um, this slide, you got to have a graph, right? Um, this gives you um, a little better idea of what the black-legged tick life stage activity is in Vermont. So um, the larvae, as I mentioned, they're going to be, you know, they hatch from the eggs in late spring, early summer. So they start, we start seeing them in June um, and then up through August or September. They're minuscule. Um, I'll show you in a little bit how we uh, do surveillance for ticks but they're very, very tiny. Um, you can barely see them with your naked eye. And they're usually a clump of them because the eggs have hatched and they'll, they, don't, they don't travel very far. So when we're dragging, um, you know, we'll, we'll hit a, a nest of larvae and there's, there's just, there can be hundreds of them, but very, very small. So then, um, I, you know, if you go through the life cycle, then the, a year later, the nymphs are gonna be active. And again, they start getting, we start seeing them in um, late May. We see them through June and July and then dwindling off in late summer. But again, that's when they're they're sort of the most risk. And then the adult life stages are most active in the spring and the fall. Um, we do a spring survey. I'll, I'll talk about that more. But um, so we try to catch some of the nymphs um, in our surveillance because we like to have those tested for uh, pathogens as well. Okay, so a little bit about tick behavior. Ticks do not jump, fly, or drop from trees. They quest from vegetation, and questing is they hang on with um, six of their legs. This is sometimes how I feel when I'm eating. <laughs> they they hang on and they um, and they stick their arms out and they are waiting for something to brush by and they they have to, to walk by and brush up against them and they will um, grab on. So they have a very limited, but black legged ticks have a very limited capacity to look for hosts any other way. Like they they have a, a very, it's believed that they have a limited capacity to, to follow like scent trails or heat trails, you know, thermal patterns for mammals or um, carbon dioxide emissions, but they um, they do pretty well by just climbing up on vegetation and, and waving their legs around. So larval and nymphal ticks um, are small and low to the ground, so they tend to seek small rodents and birds. So they're questing from leaf litter right on the ground or very short vegetation. And then the adult life stages um, are seeking larger mammals like white-tailed deer and us. So um, they will quest from taller vegetation. Okay, so habitat preference. Um, so hardwood, softwood, mixed forest with leaf litter is great. 
ticks need uh, humidity, which is, there's plenty of that in the, in the leaf litter. It also provides a little temperate air zone for them so it can protect them from temperature fluctuations. Ticks love ecotones that interface between um, environments. So um, a field next to a forest or um, you know the, uh, your yard abutting up against um, a cornfield with maybe a row of uh, an area of um, uh, brush in between. They just love those areas where they uh, they'll they'll find plenty of hosts. Hosts are either passing through or living. So deer may be passing through, and mice, other rodents um, would be hanging out in those areas. Fragmented landscape. So basically, what we're doing to Vermont, um, you know, suburban growth. Um, anytime we break up, even logging, you know, we break up the landscape. That's perfect environment for ticks. Um, old stone walls they love because of mice and chipmunks and invasive vegetation, which is a real problem in Vermont. So you can see um, there's um, that picture in the middle, lower middle is um, Japanese barberry. So about invasive shrubs and ticks. So Japanese barberry is very thick um, and we do find a lot more ticks under invasive stands. Um, it was believed that invasives just uh, originally, you know, thought that invasives just provided um, a, a big host habitat for, you know, small rodents. But in fact, um, some studies have shown that that's not really all there is to it. It really is humidity that's trapped there um, and uh, the, a temperate air um, envelope and um, protection from predators potentially. So it's really a great place for them to hang out. And as you know, invasives can just become very, very thick, which is kind of what they do. They choke out the natives. So um, they alter ecosystem functions and plant communities. Um, and again, the, they are retaining that humidity. So the warmer it is, the more active ticks are. So anything, any advantage that they can get in terms of temperature and humidity, they're gonna take. So in one study in Connecticut, uh, I'm sorry, in Maine, um, there were twice as many adults and nearly uh, twice as many nymphs in plots that were dominated by exotic invasives than in plots that were dominated by native shrubs. So there's a little advertisement to uh, plant natives whenever you can and to get rid of invasives whenever you can. So um, the way people remove them, mechanical removal, um, I go out on my property up in Duxbury and in the spring, when the honeysuckle is in blossom, and you probably all know it's one of the first ones that comes out with a blossom. It's got a white blossom, so they're pretty easy to see in the landscape. So every year I go up and I find um, I find those blossoms, and then I can you know flag the bushes with uh, survey tape so I can go back later and find them all. And um, I borrow a, a weed wrench from a friend and I just yank them out by the roots. Uh, some people burn them and some people use herbicides. Okay, so this is uh, an interesting thing. So reservoirs versus reproductive hosts. So the white-footed mouse and the eastern chipmunk are the most important reservoir hosts. And deer are the most important reproductive hosts, but they are not competent reservoirs for Lyme disease. So what does all that mean? So a reservoir host um, provides not only a meal, but they provide um, the opportunity for a tick to pick up diseases. So their bodies are reservoirs for disease. And one study found that um, over 90% of the white-footed mice in, an, in any endemic area in the Northeast um, can be carrying the Lyme disease pathogen. So there's a really high pathogen prevalence in rodents. So, um, so those small rodents are um, competent reservoir hosts for diseases in addition to being blood meals for the tick. So the tick doesn't care. The tick is just looking for blood. But in terms of the success of the pathogens, the pathogens are just hanging out waiting to get moved around. So they um, they live in those reservoir hosts. And then reproductive hosts are um, basically, um, if you're a parent, then you know that you provide meals, shelter, and transportation. And um, that's kind of what Reproductive hosts do. They um, they provide just um, a blood meal, a way for ticks to expand their population, 
by moving around on the um, on the animals when they wouldn't be able to move around on their own. Um, they provide shelter, but they do not uh, vector diseases to the ticks. In fact, deer have a component in their blood. It's called um, a Borreliacidal compound, which uh, Borrelia is the genus name for um, the Lyme disease pathogen. So their blood actually kills Lyme disease in their bodies. So they have developed the ability to protect themselves from Lyme disease, probably because of having developed alongside ticks for you know hundreds of thousands of years. So, or however long they've been doing that, a long time. So feeding behavior of ticks. Um, ticks can um, take maybe 10 minutes to up to two hours to find a spot on a, on a host where they wanna settle in and take a blood meal. They will look for a place that is um, thin skinned, um, protected, you know, warm, <laughs> uh, damp if possible, you know, behind your knees, behind your ears, um, just a, a place that, you know, you're less likely to find them because if you find them, you're going to brush them off. So the ones that stick around are the ones that you don't really know about. So they can feed um, black legged ticks and most of the ticks in our um, in our area can feed over a period of several days. Um, they basically, once they find a spot where they want to feed this thing that looks like uh, the thing in the middle on the picture there, that's, um, that's hiding the chelicerae, which are those basically <laughs> their implements of destruction, their saws and, and a, and a feeding tube. So they basically that opens up, they saw into you and dig out a little hole in your skin, um, near a blood vessel. Then they spit some cement. Now, how's your lunch going, folks? I just want to do a quick check on that. But um, they they spit cement into that cavity that they create to hold them in place. They also have barbs that point uh, in, a, in such a way that that holds them in place while they're feeding. So that makes them very hard to remove from your skin. So their ticks, the tick saliva can also contain anticoagulants. Um, and blood platelet aggregation inhibitors and other compounds that will not only, um, they, they increase the blood flow and keep you from uh, you know, uh, coagulating. And they also have a, some, a mild anesthetic so that when they're, um, they're biting you, you don't feel it. So they can, they can go undetected that way. So in most cases for the diseases that we have in the Northeast, the tick must be attached for at least 36 hours and more like 48 before um, at least the Lyme disease bacterium can be transmitted. And that's um, according to the CDC. There is a, a virus that is um, becoming um, a more widely uh, researched called Powassan virus, and that can be transmitted much, much more quickly. Okay, so one of the things that we get asked a lot, I get asked a lot, is why aren't you doing anything? Um, why why can we control mosquitoes and not ticks? And why are you just collecting data and doing surveillance, but you're not doing anything about this? Um, so um, the, the short answer is that there are no large scale coordinated municipal or state tick control programs in existence. Um, there are a few small you know, public parks that are doing um, work to try to control ticks, but there's nothing large scale or coordinated. There's less than 1% of the um, public lands in the Northeast are um, subject to tick control. Homeowners, private homeowners, and landowners can hire pesticide applicators to treat their lawn perimeters with chemicals with a permethrin. It's apparently very effective, but it's kind of expensive, and you have to do it, um, you know, more than just once. And people have, you know, different feelings about um, using chemicals in the environment. So why is this true? So if we compare mosquito control, which people often do, um, Mosquito control has been around for a really long time. Um, there's well over a hundred years of deep research. It's very well funded. There are a lot of treatment options. Uh, in addition to chemicals, there are GMO modified mosquitoes that are being released into the environment. Um, it, it, there's just been a whole lot of attention and money thrown at mosquito control for you know over a century. And that's because there's a, a worldwide interest in controlling mosquitoes. Mosquitoes kill more people 
historically and worldwide um, than any other animals. So um, there, there's a lot of attention given to them. They are also easier to control in their larval stage. They're contained to standing water. So you can not only dump a biological um, larvicide into that water and kill off a huge population of mosquitoes in, in one easy fell swoop, it's just all contained. The habitat reduction is also easier. So you can remove standing water uh, oftentimes if it's, you know, in your backyard, in the kiddie pool or, um, you know, your garden uh, pots and um, uh, tarps that hold water, eaves, um, small swales, you can treat ponds with a bi biological larvicide. So the habitat reduction and the larval stages are easier to control. And in general, there's just more public acceptance of mosquito control because it's been around for so long. So if we contrast tick control, it's a relatively new problem in the Northeast. The first uh, Lyme disease detection was in 1988 in Vermont. So that's you know fairly recent in the grand scheme of things. Um, there are just no organized public efforts yet. There's just a patchy response to management. Like I mentioned, a few public parks and a few um, homeowners are engaging in it, but it's really just you know little pinpoints here and there. Um, part of the problem is that there are lower efficacy products available. So if you're going out and, and purchasing um, pesticides, um, they're called acaricides if you're killing ticks, um, the, there's, there are fewer products available and lower efficacy products. Um, one thing that is, is really interesting is tick habitat is incredibly micro local. Um, we have a tick site down in Bennington that um, we go to for our phenology study. I'll tell you about that in a little bit, but that's, um, it's a place where it's a, it's a, it's a home run for us. When we, we want to find ticks, we know we can go there and there's a lot of them. So, but what's interesting is it's maybe 40 acre plot and it's, you know, fairly similar habitat throughout. And I can do a 400 meter drag um, and get a ton of ticks and I can go you know, 10 meters over and do it again and not find any. And it looks virtually the same and we don't know exactly what's happening. So um, the habitat can be very micro local. The, it can also be very difficult to access. So um, if, if, it's, if you're trying to treat leaf litter, that's really hard to do and you're working in among trees. And then if you look at the picture behind this text, that's um, a big stand of invasive barberry. Well, try to imagine getting any products down into there, underneath there, in any effective way to reach the ticks. It's just not going to happen. Um, it also, like I mentioned, it would involve not just treating public lands, but it would involve applying chemicals on private lands to, to achieve any widespread control over ticks. And that's such an individual and personal choice that that's not probably going to be something that we're all ever going to agree on. And in general, there's just less public acceptance for um, chemicals that are used. Okay, well, we're not victims. What can we do? Um, we can reduce tick habitat by removing invasives. Um, we can clear brush from areas uh, where we hang out outdoors. We can mow paths around our property. We can use mulch, wood chips, or gravel for those paths. Um, you can make pads out of gravel or wood chips <clears throat> to put under swing sets and, you know, play equipment, patio furniture, wood piles, um, any, any place where you're hanging out outdoors. You basically, ticks in general don't like to cross anything like mulch or grass or gravel. Um, so you can um, maintain um, a barrier between the ecotone where they're probably going to be and then areas that you spend time outdoors. And again, removing the invasives will remove those humid um, protected areas that ticks love so much. You can do something that, you know, often is a little bit similar to, to remove or reduce um, host uh, habitat. So deer exclusion from um, using fences or repellents, those are you know, different degrees of success for that. Um, you can do deer resistant plantings. There are uh, in my notes that I can't see, I have several <laughs> lists of deer resistant plantings, but I can get you all that information afterwards. Um, remove other food sources that deer and rodents might like. For instance, if you have fruit trees and the fruit falls onto the ground or nuts, um, corn, 
anything that's going to attract deer and rodents, um, clean up underneath those, bring your bird feeders in during the summer when ticks are tending to be most active to keep the mice um, away from your property where you hang out in your house. Should always store your bird seed and pet food in airtight containers anyway, um, but particularly if they're outdoors. Um, any host-friendly habitat you can get rid of, piles of logs, leaves, brush, rocks, building materials, trash, old vehicle, piles of metal, whatever you have lying around that's going to provide a place for rodents to hide. You, If you clean those up, chances are you're going to reduce your rodent load. And then repairing or sealing any holes in your house foundations or outbuildings, which will um, remove nesting habitat for mice and uh, chipmunks and stuff. And then the other thing that can be engaged in on a broader scale is public education. So um, signage at trails, um, parks, closing trails. There are some, um, uh, some of our colleagues in around New England have told us that they have seen the public um, parks close at times when ticks are very active or when there's uh, a, a very high disease prevalence, either in people or in the ticks that are tested. Uh, municipal cleanup efforts like curbside pickup of leaf and plant debris may encourage people to uh, clean up their yards. Okay, so here's a nice little picture provided by our friends at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station um, describing basically just creating a tick safe zone by using landscaping. So um, wood chips along a stone wall under foundation plantings a barrier of about three feet wide of mulching, um, simply not going into the forest and brush where the deer and the rodents and the ticks are commonly found because we're not going to get rid of them. Uh, using that barrier of wood chips or rocks um, between tick zones, rock walls, keeping that separate from the lawn. Again, the wood piles on the wood chip barrier and then maintaining a nine foot barrier of lawn between the wood chips and any patios or gardens and play sets. So basically you're just kind of creating a, a, a no crawl zone. So for tick bite prevention, we use a, a DEET, an EPA registered insect repellent. <clears throat> there are um, a lot of them out there and people have preferences um, and, and things that they don't like. So that's a uh, personal choice. Uh, we wear light colored long sleeve shirts and pants so that you can see ticks crawling on you when they do. And tucking your pants into your socks, always a good look, but it uh, it does keep the ticks from, it, it, it makes them work a little bit harder and you're a lot likely, a lot more likely to see them crawling up your socks than if they, all they have to do is get onto your boots and then jump into your boots. So um, that can be uh, one uh, fashion statement that actually works in your favor. Uh, we do permethrin treated clothing for our techs in the summer. We use Sawyer's. It's a product that you spray onto your clothes. Um, you don't ever put it on your skin, but you spray it on your clothes. You let it dry completely. Um, and then it will last through several washings. I usually only have to do it a couple of times in the summer. To, I have a set of clothes that I treat and just use for going out to do surveillance. Um, avoiding tick heavy areas. That's fairly obvious. And if you do go in, then um, certainly, you know, check yourself quickly. Um, when I've been outdoors and I come back in, I immediately strip down, put my clothes in the dryer and high for 15 minutes. If the clothes are dry, that will kill the ticks. If your clothes are damp or wet, it takes a lot longer. That humidity, it, it, it affords them some protection from the heat. So either uh, either turn it, turn it up higher or leave it, leave it in there longer. I would probably leave it in for a half an hour at least. Um, and then while my clothes are in the dryer, I jump in the shower and anything that's crawling and has not attached gets washed off. And that's an opportunity to also do a daily tick check, which you should do because if you want to catch it within a 24 hour window, which is recommended, um, then if you do it every day, you're a lot more likely to find any ticks and prevent disease, um, getting a disease. Uh, so then anything that you find, you should remove from your skin and watch for symptoms. Okay, so it, even after all of our careful work, we still get a tick on us. You should take it off as soon as possible. Use uh, fine tipped tweezers. I have a pair of forceps that I use. Grasp the tick as close to your skin as you can. And then you pull upward with a steady, even pressure. Don't twist or jerk. As tempting as it is, you just want to get it out of there, but it, it, it doesn't work. 
Um, we recommend not using any of the DIY ideas that people send out like uh, Vaseline or gasoline or matches and absolutely not those last two things at the same time. Um, but you, you want to do what you can to get it out. Um, after you've gotten it out, you should clean the area and wash your hands um, with soap and water, maybe clean the area with rubbing alcohol. And um, dispose of the tick by flushing it down the toilet. You can also keep it in um, a, a little jar in rubbing alcohol if you want to have someone take a look at it afterwards. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. You can also put it in a sealed bag. Just checking my time. How long do I? I think I have an hour. Uh, okay, I'll keep going here. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, okay, so after you put, oh, and if you if you accidentally leave the mouth parts in your skin, don't freak out. Um, I've done it a bunch of times. It just looks like a little dot in your skin. The mouth parts are not capable of transmitting the diseases that we have in Vermont. It's just kind of creepy to think that the mouth parts are stuck in your skin. So um, you treat it like a splinter, you know, try to get it out if you can, but don't dig at it um, and, you know, disinfect it. So, but it's not, uh, it's not a reason to panic. Okay, so we are not doctors and I'm quick to say that, but we have uh, encountered Lyme disease more than once. Um, common symptoms, we probably all know them. Um, fever, chills, fatigue, aches and pains, that rash, that um, uh, bullseye rash, is not, um, does not happen all the time. It's very diagnostic when it does, but um, it doesn't happen all the time. So it's, it's not to be relied on. If you start to feel yucky after, um, well, if you start to feel yucky anytime, you know, check with your doc. But if you know that you had a tick bite and if you kept the tick, that's particularly useful. Um, you can, you know, show it to your doctor or if you use our passive tick surveillance program, which I'll tell you about, um, you will know what the what species of tick um, you have, what uh, life stage, what the sex is, and the rate of engorgement. So um, we can help you out with that. Um, and it's helpful to know that information because not all ticks can make you sick. And it can quickly, a doctor can quickly say, oh, well, this is not a, probably not a tick-borne disease because this is not a, a tick that, that spreads disease in Vermont. So there's more information um, on tick-borne diseases on the Vermont Department of Health website. They have a, a page on their website called Be Tick Smart. That's very useful. That's at healthvermont.gov. And the CDC also has some great information. And you can always look on our, our website, agriculture.vermont.gov. That will give you um, things like annual reports on disease prevalence. And there's also more information on our passive tick surveillance program. So, Active tick surveillance involves dragging and flagging, like I mentioned. Um, it is a one meter square white flag that we drag through leaf litter and over vegetation for a specific distance. We then can calculate density based on what we find. We stop every 10 meters and pick the ticks off from the flag and off from ourselves, put them in a vial, and then we um, get them tested. That happens in the spring and in the fall. So the tick programs that we have at the Agency of Agriculture, we do one with the Vermont Department of Health. It's a targeted tick surveillance. So we visit 20, uh, 48 sites twice in the spring, uh, about three weeks apart. So we'll go and go back in three weeks. Those ticks are collected and tested for um, four pathogens over on the right there, the top four. Um, and the CDC tests those for us. And then we also have our own um, tick density surveillance that we do in which we visit every town in Vermont once over five years. So we've got whatever we've got 200 and it's not 251. It's because we have gores and whatever. So we split it up and we were able to visit every town in Gore and um, over a five year period. And we have those ticks tested for five pathogens. So all five over on the right. Um, so Borrelia burgdorferi up top there is the Lyme disease pathogen. Um, we it's pretty stable across all of our studies. We find it in 55-ish percent generally. Anaplasma phagocytophilum causes anaplasmosis. We find that in about 10% of our ticks. That's a um, disease of uh, rising concern in the Northeast. Babesia microti causes babesiosis. That's, we find that in uh, much fewer um, of our tick specimens, about 3%. Borrelia miyamotoi causes miyamotoi disease. That's in um, about 
less than 1% of our ticks. And then deer tick virus, which is also known as Powassan virus, is also found very rarely in our tick specimens. So our passive tick surveillance program is kind of cool. I started it in 2015, um, and then it was just me sort of calling my friends and saying, hey, send me any ticks that you find. And now um, we actually get, a, you know, I don't know, hundreds of submissions now. So I'm really excited about this. It's, it's a resource for Vermonters. Um, and we do not um, we do not test these ticks, but what we can do is tell you, um, like I said, if you get a, a tick bite or if you find a tick crawling on you and you want to know what it is, send it to us. We'll tell you um, it, it, what the species is. Is it an adult or a nymph? Um, how long it was likely to have been feeding on you if it was, what the sex is. Males are a lot less likely to transmit disease than females. Um, and the longer they're on, the more likely they are able to transmit disease. So, and then in return for you sending us your ticks, we get to sort of track some species that we might not otherwise see. So the Lone Star tick all the way over on the right, um, we've actually found a few of those through our um, passive tick surveillance program. So that's kind of exciting. We, we don't really find them in our drags, our surveillance drags. So. You can find information for submitting them physically um, by going to the Agency of Agriculture website, agriculture.vermont.gov. And excuse me, you can also email photos to our, our, tick, um, our field coordinator. And I'll make sure that you have all this information after. Oh my God, I'm almost sort of on time. This is exciting and it never happens. I, it helps not having my notes. I think I'm going faster. Um, okay, so. TikTok takeaways, uh, it's very important to know where ticks live, what they are, how they behave. They're not all gonna make you sick, but it's good to know which ones can. Um, it's important to protect yourself using the, the uh, methods that we talked about and do your regular tick checks and remove any ticks that you do find on your body. And then um, if you are interested, you can engage in some tick control through habitat and host management. So a few more resources, um, and again, I'll make sure that Lisa has these for you after the CDC, cdc.gov, um, healthvermont.gov is where the Tick Smart stuff is located. Um, University of Rhode Island has done some great stuff with something called Tick Encounter, and a lot of that is appropriate for Vermont. We have a lot of the same species. Um, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station does a great job. We work with them a lot. They have a tick management handbook. And then, um, the the health department does not recommend testing any ticks that you find on your body or on your, your dog or your, your kids or whatever. Um, there are several reasons for that, but sometimes people are really insistent and um, they really, really want to have their tick tested. It's not a good idea, but there is a place in Pennsylvania. I think it's the University of Pennsylvania. It's called TickCheck.com. And for a fee... Um, they'll do a panel of analytes um, testing to see what the tick might be carrying. Um, but but I it's 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 really not recommended. So and I can talk more about that if anybody wants to know why. And a few more. Um, there's a, I wrote an article this spring for our pesticide applicators, but it's really just a, it's kind of a history and overview. It goes into a lot more detail into um, black-legged ticks in Vermont. And um, I sent that to Lisa this morning as a little party favor for after the, the, uh, after the presentation today. And then uh, my buddy, Dr. Sullivan up at UVM made this really cool fact sheet, which Lisa also has, create an unfriendly yard for ticks. So that's, that's pretty neat. And then um, I always like to finish by saying, you know, we all live here in Vermont. It's rugged, it's gorgeous. We're here because, probably because we love it. And I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to um, stay out or stay inside and, you know, out of the wilderness. So I, I do like to go outdoors. I go outside all the time. I have just learned to be very careful. Like Lisa said, I grew up in Virgins and I'm old enough that when I was growing up, there really were no ticks. Um, that that we encountered. I know there have been ticks in Vermont all along, but they were not the problem that they are now. So, um, oh, one cool thing I forgot to tell you is that the Iceman, um, the 5,300-year-old mummy, this is why you need your notes, was found to have 
uh, Lyme disease or a very similar um, a, a, a Lyme, a Borrelia uh, type Lyme disease. So it's been around for a really long time. It, it is not new. It's just, it's much more prevalent. But that said, that's not a reason to um, to stay inside. So, so with that, I will say thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for your time. I don't know if you had anything else to do when I sucked up all the time. Um, I apologize, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments or suggestions. And I will, should I, I guess I should stop sharing my screen. Yes, I shall. That's I'm great. Fine. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I learned things. I didn't know the nymph had six legs and the nymph, I mean, the larva had six legs and the nymph and the adult had eight legs. So that was news to me. Um, and, um, I'll remind you to send me the deer resistant planting ideas, um, and I'll send those out to everybody and I'll send everything she mentioned, uh, or try anyway. And when I send out the recording, that might be five to seven days. So give me a little time to get that to you. Um, there are some questions that are pouring into the, um, the chat box. The first one that just caught my eye that I'm going to ask, someone asked if you would comment on the twisting removal tools, um, so you said don't, you know, for removing a tick, there are some that sort of pull, there's the scoopy ones, there are some that, so you had mentioned not twisting. So if you could just sort of comment on that, that would be great. Yeah, the CDC and the health department um, recommendations, which is what we use for guidance, are just to pull straight up. Um, and there's uh, there are things like a tick key, which um, we give those out whenever we have them to give out. And it's like a, it's sort of a metal V and you slide slide it onto the skin, onto your skin. So the tick is sticking up, you know, but at the very, it's very uh, narrow end at the V. And then you, you just, it's the, the important thing is just to keep a steady pulling pressure, because if you think that those mouth parts, you got to remember, <laughs> they're basically in a little ball of cement in your skin. So um, twisting them is much, that torsion is much more likely to result in breaking the mouth parts off. So I think that's what, what the recommendation is to not twist. I've done everything. I've yanked. I've tw I haven't used gasoline or matches, but I have um, I have twisted. And the, my most successful removals have been with my forceps and just a steady. And it really can take a couple minutes. Yeah, it's hard. You don't want to be patient because you're like you want it out. So it's really hard to to be patient when when yanking those out. Um, someone asked, you said not to send them in to get checked. You don't necessarily recommend that. And they asked why. Ah, okay. Yeah, so I'm going to give you the rundown from the health department. Um, so there, there's four big reasons. Um, one is that, so say you pull a tick off your skin um, and send it in. Um, even if that tick tests positive, it does not mean that you contracted Lyme disease. So there's actually... So tick prep, tick, the pathogen prevalence, so Lyme disease prevalence in the tick population is about 55% of the ticks. The actual percentage of sort of, and I don't know how this is calculated, but there's a very low percentage of possibility that any tick encounter will result in you getting sick. So a whole lot of things can go wrong um, in terms of wrong, meaning for the, for the disease. Um, you, you, um, the tick may not, it just may not have transmitted it to you. So it, it may not have been on long enough. Um, it may be an incompetent uh, vector. It may not just, it just, the transmission may not have happened. And that happens more often than, than we realize. So, so even if the tick that you remove and send in is infected and it, it tests positive, it may not have made you sick. You may then go and get um, treated for an illness that you don't have, which weakens the antibiotic tools that we have. We all know we're not supposed to take antibiotics if we are not sick. So that's that's one big reason. It actually could delay treatment um, if you are waiting for results to come back and you you have contracted the illness. It will delay a treatment. If your doctor says, you know, yeah, I think we're going to give you a treatment. It doesn't really matter whether the tick has it or not. Um, if, if your doctor has decided that the risk is such that, yeah, we're going to give you um, antibiotics, you know, whether the tick tests positive or not, it, it, that's kind of irrelevant to the treatment. Um, most people who are infected um, with a tick-borne disease don't recall having had a tick bite. So if you were to develop symptoms of a tick-borne disease, um, there would be no way to know whether the infection was from 
that tick that you sent in or from another tick bite. So if, for example, if a tick is tested and the result is negative, you could still have been in, infected um, by another tick, not know it and develop symptoms later. So, and then the, the last reason that they give is that um, the tests that, per, that are performed on tick, ticks are not re necessarily reliable. Some of them are and some of them aren't, but so all of those together, um, the recommendation is remove the tick. If you if you know, if you find a tick on you, it's a female, adult, black-legged tick that's engorged, I would go to my doctor immediately and say, give me the doxy because the chance I've got a pretty high chance of contracting Lyme disease and I just don't wanna deal with it. I also expose myself to it a lot on purpose. So, um, but most, the recommendation is conservative, watch and wait. So remove the tick and then um, watch for symptoms, it's particularly if it was on for a short period of time. Yeah, I, you know, I've known about Lyme's disease for years and years and thought I knew a lot. And my son worked in, in uh, landscaping and he came home and he had a, it, was, it, was, it wasn't the bullseye, right? It was just that he's like, what's this mommy? I'm like, I don't know what that is. And it, I said, let's see if it goes away in a couple of days, right? It didn't go away. And I'm like, let's go to the doctor. The doctor's like, oh, it's Lyme disease. Because I expected a bullseye, right? You know, the center and then the concentric rings, but this was just one even patch of red, you know, is the way it manifested in him. And so it was very interesting to me to learn about these different ways that, that it kind of showcases or presents or doesn't present, right? Yeah, that's funny. My son was in landscaping and he had the exact same thing happen. He had a red patch on his arm and I knowing enough about ticks and I had pulled the tick off and my, you know, I sent him up to the doc and I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the doctor was like, by then it did look like a bullseye, but yeah. So the bullseye shows up in roughly the statistics are 60 to 70% of the time, but this is true. Um, it, it has shown up um, a person with one tick bite has had multiple bullseyes all over their whole body. And no one knows exactly why that happened. But, hmm. but there was um, that what I, I didn't believe that I had to look that up with um, colleagues, doctors, and they were like, yep, that has happened. So God knows how, what goes wrong with that. But <laughs> so someone had asked the black legged ticks, they are on any mammal, like they'll be on your dog just as likely as a deer. So they're not host specific. Yes, that's the thing that's so awful about them. Um, many, many of the ticks in Vermont, we will never see. You will never see a beaver tick. I can't even, you know, they're, they're, they're very, very host specific. Um, Black-legged ticks and, and dog ticks are the exception to that. And black-legged ticks in particular, they're, they're not only ex wildly generalist feeders, but they also, they're, cons they're they have what's called a dirty gut, meaning that they, their the the mid gut is where the pathogens um, live and are and are transmitted through the mid mid gut, which is why it takes a while for it to be transmitted because it has to travel up the mid gut. But they um they have so a dirty mid gut means that they are they can host a lot of different pathogens more so than really any of the other ticks around. So you had mentioned fifteen species of ticks in Vermont that we know of and six that convey, disease, convey diseases. So Catherine wanted to know, what are the six ticks that convey disease in Vermont? Oh, I was gonna ask that. Well, the dog tick um, cannot really, uh, and this is, the research can change, but so the deer tick, obviously, um, we rarely see the lone star tick, but they are capable of um, um, vectoring, uh, Let's see, they can vector ehrlichiosis, which we have seen in Vermont. Tularemia, we don't really see in Vermont. They're the ones that can vector um, alpha-gal syndrome, which is the um, uh, aller uh, red meat allergy. It can also be a milk allergy. So it's a pr to pr mammal proteins. Um, so um, those two, let's see, woodchuck ticks, squirrel ticks, that's four. I kind of forget about some of the other ones because they um, we just don't see them very much. The brown dog tick, we also see very, very rarely. Um, that's much more Southern. Um, let's see, I know I'm forgetting something. Uh, uh, I will have to look into that. I will find that out and let you know. Thank you. Um, yep. 
One last question. Um, is there any truth to the rumor that the prevalence of the bullseye appearing when bit by a tick carrying Lyme disease has actually been decreasing? I've never heard that. I don't know. I neither. Yeah. Well, that's we'll interesting. To, we'll have to watch for that one. Yeah. No, that's very interesting. I don't know. I, uh, that would be a great, a great question for the folks at the health department. Well, that's great. Well, I think we've addressed all the questions that were in the chat. Um, I really, you know, it's funny. We talk a lot about, you know, rewilding areas, right, to create wildlife habitat. That's something Vermont Coverts is very interested in. And so working between these two things, I really like the recommendations for the yard. You know, you still can have wild areas, you know, keep them kind of a little separate. I have another cooperator who talks about mow where you go, right? So keep it short and distance where you want to spend your time, like you said, your patio, your child's play area, the garden, but then you may want to then rewild areas elsewhere. So trying to find that balance, I think is really important as we look, you know, you're working with pollinators and pollinator health. So we need pollinator plants. So, um, and then of course, always as we recommend highly is, uh, you know, working on treating invasives, all the different invasives that we have. That's, that's a huge, huge way that we can help both the wildlife, the forests, and ourselves in terms of, of overall health. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned pollinators because that, that's a huge, um, it's, a, it's a big issue and it's a fine line that we do have to walk. So in recommending that people, you know, manage brush and stuff around their yards, I always say in my notes, I would have said, um, <laughs> you know, be, be aware pollinator aware so mow where you go you know have your area and then just be aware when you go into those other wild areas that you may be exposing yourself to ticks and then dress smart yes excellent <laughs> i agree with you i am not going to be chased indoors i will be out there i'll just be smart and thank you patty so much for your time over this lunch thank you all for participating today i'll be sending out the link uh to our youtube channel when i post this along with the uh, information that patty said uh, she sent me this morning so stay tuned you'll have some um, communication from me and uh, you can share this uh video with your friends once it comes out thank you all thank you patty great thank you everybody